I'm an introvert with uh, extrovert tendencies. All of these things that go into the computer can cause fear and panic. Oh, mate, I, I love you, mate. It's so kind. Do know that it does feel like it isn't going to end. It will. How do I? How do I? Oh, balls. Robbie, how are you, brother? I'm really good. Today, I am really good. Um, it's nice to speak to you. You've already made my day. You sent me a really nice message this morning. And um... Yeah, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. It, I, your, your empathy and your compassion really, really touched me. And I'll tell you why. I was watching the SAS program. And, um, and then I went on YouTube to... I, I found you basically, and you were talking about the SAS program and um, how, how you interpreted their life and their story and the empathy that you gave them is really crucial right now, just in general. So um, I thought I'd reach out to you and say I appreciated it. Oh, mate, I, I love you, mate. It's so kind. And I asked you before you before you pressed record uh, I asked you how you were and you say kindly your guests ask you how you are and I always say the same thing you said I'm uh, I'm in paradise and it's all in there I'm in content I've got to content how do you get to paradise I don't think there's any such thing as like being happy every day right I wish there was it would be great if that was an end goal you could just aim for that and one day you get there and but I don't think you ever get that. Life is always going to be ups and downs. And the way to live in paradise is how you interpret those ups and downs. So it's how you make sense of, you know, everyday incidents that might not be pleasant or, you know, or they might be the opposite, might be, might be um, delightful. But it's kind of like, like rolling with the highs and rolling with the lows, but staying in the middle. Basically, all of these things that go into the computer can cause fear and panic. The difference between me now as a middle-aged man and the person that I used to be, I saw it, said, that's interesting. Tomorrow will be different. And it was. Whereas before... I understand a little bit about your history. If that would have happened, I thought, I used to think that I was going to feel that way for a decade. When I joined the Marines, you know, I joined the toughest basic training in the world or passed the toughest basic training in the world. I just took everything as it came, Rob, you know? Right, what we're doing today, we're doing that. Right, give it your best. Try and pass. Tomorrow's a new day. Da 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 da. It was when. Um, you know, drugs, possibly a bad acid trip I had once. After that, I started to know what anxiety is and, and, and that kind of thing. And this girl moving forward to South Africa recognized that I was in an anxious state sort of thing. She just went, don't worry about a thing. Cause every little thing's gonna be all right. I'm singing to Robbie Williams. There you go. There's there's a tick off the bucket list. <laughs> nice. I was different to you. I, I sort of took drugs to fill in the blanks, you know. And when fame came to me at a very early age, I was 16 when I joined Take That. It sort of magnified all of the negative aspects of who I thought I was. And uh, before that, I was quite content, but I was vulnerable and incredibly sensitive. And I felt like I'd, bore, I'd been born with an open wound. And then when I was thrown into this mosh pit of uh, show business, it 
intensified the negative aspects of my own self-doubt. So I took drugs to um, become the person that I that the world was telling me I should be. When really, you know, I'm a, an introvert uh, and it's okay to be an introvert. I'm an introvert with uh, extrovert tendencies. I'm an extrovert for a living, but I'm an introvert in real life. I wonder if um, the anxiety and the depression and the lack of self-worth and self-esteem for you was a sleeper cell. Do you know what I mean? It was there, but maybe you just blocked to out because of the uh, trauma of what happened to you. How do I, how do I, oh balls, how do I get, get the screen back on? Your, I can oh, see you. Feels should I, uh, should I call you back and you can edit it in? Yeah, well let's, let's do that. Fine. No, no, no. Mate, I'm, I'm loving it. Okay, so you were saying that you um, have a binge every now and again. This is what I'm finding for me. I've been sober for 20 years. I haven't had a drink for 20 years. In that period, there was a period of time for a year where I relapsed on a certain substance. Um, when I was 19, something happened to me one evening where I woke up the next day and thought, oh, I'm an alcoholic and I'm an addict. I didn't do anything about it for another two to three years. I've mainly been a sober person for a majority of my life. Where I am now as a 46 year old is content. I don't, there's no binge. You know, I think the last bastion of negative addictions for me that I can't cope with is food. And I've sort of, I'm getting that down. I'm uh, managing that. I'm managing that addiction. What I was thinking over the last couple of weeks in this slipstream that I find myself in of sobriety is the delusion of our reality when we were growing up. How old are you? I'm 50 now. Okay. So the school doors close and the pub doors open. And as simple as we breathe, we just walk into those pubs. And it's a lottery whether you survive them or not. Mm. What it's becoming apparent to me is there doesn't have to be that paradigm. The paradigm that you, you, you get your entertainment and you deal with life from numbing yourself. You know, I, I, I'm just, I don't want to do anything about it. I'm just finding it interesting as a sober person of 46 to go, yeah, we didn't need to do that. Mm. But it was just the it was just the route the river was taking you. You know, um, and I've got four kids, and I and they're all young. My oldest is seven. The youngest is three months old. And I wonder how they are going to approach that particular phase of their life, and how I'm going to approach that particular phase of their lives with them. Because mm. I, 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 I don't know about you, right? Mm. And I know this sounds crazy. To some, it might not. I think drugs are like the equivalent of a Ouija board. And you don't know what you're opening up. And I think that when people talk about demons and sorting out their demons, I think they're actual demons. Let me tell you, the greatest hits of the worst time I've ever had with drugs or painkillers. Mm. Yeah, it's the angels, my song, of the greatest hits that have been the most problematic. Nothing is a day trip or a walk in the park, but pain medication is fucking evil. Yeah. Evil and legal, just like alcohol, you know. And meanwhile, you know, the, um, the people that own the patent for 
those pain medications are, are currently living in 50,000 square foot houses. Here's the thing, somebody might be watching this that's actually currently medicated, that mm -hmm. knows exactly what we're talking about. And I would say to them, um, there, is a, there is a new reality that you can step into. It isn't easy. And uh, while you wean yourself off those things, you feel like the pain and the discomfort is never going to end. Uh, but the truth is, it does. Uh, and uh, the other side is freedom. I think it's important that people know that. Uh, do know that it does feel like it isn't going to end. It will. We've been to places that only Superman is inhabited. Mm. So we think that's normal. It's not. You know, for me, my paradise right now is not being in pain and is feeling content. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's the sort of a rebalancing of the Richter scale. You know, I often say to people, rate your day, 10 being orgasmic and one being suicidal. And uh, I just think we need to rejig the scale, you know, because what I'm expecting as a 10, I can't inhabit that place unless I become a monk and meditate daily for weeks and weeks and weeks and years and years and years, but I can inhabit a different 10, my 10. Um, do you know what I'm saying? Yes, very much. I think when I use the word paradise, maybe it sounds a bit too powerful, a bit, bit too sort of idyllic, I, I, because content, I could, I, could equ I could equally substitute paradise with content I think I use the word paradise because like I genuinely love this planet. I really do. I mean, I'd love the universe, but I don't, I don't think I'm going to see much of it. But effectively, my bottom dollar is we're carbon molecules, right? That's what we're made of, the same as you know, everything else. Well, the first thing that, that thinking that way does is it, it takes away your fear of death because – you can't go anywhere. Even if you wanted to, you can't go anywhere. Yeah, I, you know. I wrote a lyric and it said, uh, I'm not scared of dying, I just don't want to. <laughs> yes, perfect. Yeah. You know, I think I did uh, that the other day, actually, because I think it really resonated with me. Yeah, uh, it, it's from, from a song of mine called Come Undone. Um, yeah, this is an avatar, you know, you, the, the Chris, the Robbie Williams. Mm. I believe this is an avatar. I say I believe. I think I have a knowing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I think I have a knowing. Now, I'm either mad or I know some shit. <laughs> I'm picking up from you that you and I, same thing, that people call research, right? And is it research or are we just watching videos on YouTube and are we stuck in an echo chamber? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. Do you ever ask yourself the question, are we, is this a simulation? Is this just some... Hey, mate, I asked myself that. I, I, was, I was nine years old. I was on a BMX. I was outside Port Vale Stadium. And I was by myself, and I had this overwhelming sense that none of this is real. Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely terrified, and I pedaled home as quick as my legs could carry me, and I didn't mention it. Mm -hmm. I still feel the same. I'm not scared about it. I had this weird, I don't know if it was a dream, but when I was a kid, I dreamt for some reason I was walking along this wall, then all of a sudden everything went white. And I had this kind of feeling that, and the kind of aura, if you could describe the aura, it was like, that's it, it's over. And now when I look back at it, I think, was I imagining like all out, you know, a nuclear holocaust? That's what, 
as an adult, you you would have described of what I, what I experienced. Um, I don't know. This is a, Sorry, that triggers a thought for me because my my first memory of being a child, we lived in a pub until I was four years old. So I can differentiate when my memory started. My first memory is astral projection. You know, in, in dream state, um, floating off around the town. So that's my first memory. Um, you're, you're saying that's it, it's over, was that nuclear holocaust? Um, it's interesting. Social media on a whole, I think is a bad thing, but I've been able to connect with you instantaneously and this has happened in a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. So there is good that comes out of it too. I do uh, Instagram live stuff. At the moment, I'm doing this thing called Corona Oki where I take requests and I sing to people. But in the past, I've uh, gone live with people, random people, and chatted with them. The amount of spirit that I picked up just talking to people on Instagram Live has been incredible. The amount of people that I talk to that are carers, that are nurses, that are fans of mine, that like what I do. In fact, I only kind of speak to people that care for things and and the earth and other people. And um, for, for that alone, I'm glad that social media exists. Um, but then there's the, the negativity that's very, very powerful that um, people, you know, it's an energy. And I have the ability to um, join in with that energy too. It's only because of the position that I'm in that I suppose I don't. Otherwise, I'd be throwing callous, dismissive, disparaging, shameful, judgmental opinions too out into the universe willy-nilly, I think. Mm. But because I am the recipient of um, those, uh, that abuse, um, I know what it feels like, so I don't do it. But I guess that if I was Rob that was in Stoke-on-Trent that hadn't been lucky enough to audition for Take That and get in, I'd be doing the same thing. You know, I'm surrounded by people in the forces. Special boat service, uh, service that's what SBS, uh, yeah. Marines, Army, um, and I love them. Mm. Very, very, very special people. You know, uh, they look after me and, um, yeah, I, I, I love them to bits. There is a sort of knowing that they have and an understanding. And I, I, I think also all of them that I've worked with over the past 30 years, there's no chip. Mm. There's no chip on the shoulder because they've, they've done it. They don't, they don't, they're not, they're not sort of, they don't have to be the big I am because they were the big I am. <laughs> well, it's like the SAS Who Dares Wins program, isn't it? When you see them go in their little gaggle in their hut and they have to discuss the, um, I'm going to call them contestants, but the, the selectees, I suppose we'd call them. They're really quite nice about them, aren't they? they? It's almost like they care and they want, and that's what the Marines is like. In, in, in training, they, you might be put through your paces and you, you might get, bar you don't get barked at a lot in the Marines. It's not sort of like you, you'd experience in the army, for example, some Sergeant Major just shouting at you like you're, you know, you're a nothing. But you do get shouted at at times and you get what you call beasted, which is just severe kind of physical, endurance like uh, exercise which is put on you as a form of punishment but it's all that's to serve to, to you know to create a fighter machine at the end of the day that that follows orders obviously when they're told but behind the scenes they're they're, they're quite thoughtful people and they'll sit down and say right this this recruit through he's good at this he's good there what do we think about that how can we kind of, you know, encourage him to get better there? And yeah, so I can imagine your 
your security boys are of that kind of ilk. And special forces guys are really cool. They're not what people think they are. Um, if you see my chat with Colin McLaughlin, he's a really just an absolute gentleman. For seven weeks, I haven't um, clicked a headline or read the news. I also don't really watch the TV, um, apart from a few odds and sods. But I'm on YouTube all the time. <laughs> Probably a bit like this me. Is, I, this is this is where I get my news. Yeah. Well, it's the it's the it's the certainly the better way. Although, obviously, this platform is becoming more and more censored. Um. Probably. Oh, which, which which reminds me, which I want to get onto. So we're all watching the same videos. We're all coming up to the same conclusions. Mm. But um, I'm on the other side of the veil, right? I'm on the other side of the curtain. And um, just for context, um, you know, sold 80 million albums, sold 10 million tickets for people to come see me. It was the biggest artist on the planet for two years, maybe three years. And I say this not for ego, just for context. Hey, right? Rob, you, you can say what you like, mate, because you've thoroughly deserved it. And you've... Well, you've well, bless you. Thanks, Chris. But there's a reason that I'm saying this, right? Because this is what I'm worried about. And it's um, discernment and the echo chamber that we find ourselves in, right? You would think that the platform that I was given and have, that I would have heard something, know something, or been invited to something, right? Hmm. I can tell you, on my children, I know nothing. Haven't been invited, haven't heard. The only thing that I ever heard about was what everybody else heard about, and I heard about that when I wasn't famous, was Jimmy Savile, hmm. right? So this is what I'm saying to you. And it's really important because we're coming up with our own conclusions, but we're also magnifying our own thoughts and theories. And the maths is off. Mm. Do, do you know what I'm saying? And yeah, if it's I, I do because I, yeah. I, I, tell, I, I tell you, I tell you, you know, everybody's saying, you know, this and and this, and all of these things, and Hollywood's in on it, and everybody is in on it. It's not true. Mm. You know, it's not true. You know, everybody's not in, it, in on it. I'm not saying that there aren't people that are. I don't know. But you would have thought I would have heard something. And that's what I'm saying. It's sort of like, look, I was bread fed, breastfed red pills. But... The reason why I don't indulge this outside of you and other people that I talk to is because there is a chance that you could become a red pillock. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Oh, exactly. I think it's why a lot of people get to a certain point, Rob, and then they just pull back because it, it all gets into the realm of subjectivity. Yeah. You know? And you do, you think, hang on a second, there's Rob there in Los Angeles, he's got a beautiful wife, he's got four gorgeous kids, he's, he's, he's trying to get by, you know, like, ev like everybody else is. Um, really, has he got time to be going to meetings and, you know, drinking the blood of children and all this kind of stuff, right? I, I, I would say right here and now, I wouldn't, dismiss anything um, me neither me neither yeah. why then why all the symbolism what what is who listen i'm down for symbolism will be their downfall yeah i'm down for that. but who you know, actually I, gets it in the in the in the videos and the and the and the, and the songs no, and no, 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 let me tell you let me tell you you know the zeitgeist of the moment is this talk for certain people, right? What popular culture does and pop music does 
is regurgitate what it's receiving and present it back to you. Now, I myself, like I remember when I did um, the shame video with Gary Barlow, I put on a Masonic um, ring because I wanted to, I wanted to wind people up. You know, I wanted to, um, you know, prod them <laughs> and take the piss. What people, and I, in my lyrics, I've put in things that those will know will understand. And those that don't, it just passes them by. The reason that I've put them in is because I'm going, hey, I'm interested in this. That's what I'm doing. Mm. Is I got, I'm interested in this. I think there's something in it. And then I sort of, I suppose that it's sort of like for me, sending out an all points bulletin going, are you picking this up too? Are you receiving this too? You know, and I wonder if that's what other people are doing because that's what I'm doing. You know, it's like I've got, I've got lyrics out there that are really dark that people don't know are dark. Mm. You know? And what I don't want is that to come back and kick me in the ass and have people think I'm one of them because that's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. mm. That's really, really dangerous. You know, it, and, and we know with, I won't say the words, but you know, if you like a dough based um, food with a, a dairy topping on it, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, you know, there's sort of like this, the, the, this sort of out of control red pilling can come back and bite a lot of people in the ass. And there's a lot of people pointing at people and they don't know. Hmm. They don't know. We've all, we've all heard the same YouTube documentaries and hmm. talks, but nobody fucking knows. There's no point in having a YouTube channel and working your ass off, which is what you have to do to, to make it work. To have it demonetized. Yeah, just to have just to just to have it taken away from you. And it's interesting. I mean, David Icke puts a lot of stuff out there on his YouTube and you do it does make you wonder how and I'm not, not suggesting anything for one minute, but it just makes you wonder how he gets away with it. Uh, yeah, me too. But let, can I also state for the record, this is not a hill that I want to die on either. You know, I don't want to become the face of this. Mm. You know, it's like I, I'm, um, I'm a interested bystander that's connecting dots too. Mm. But I, I'm, not, I'm not here to lead a charge. Because I have as much truth as everybody else does. And I don't even know if it's true. Mm. The narrative of who I am has been dictated by people um, that gaslight in positions of immense power. You know, oh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, perception is, uh, is everything. Mm. You know... Who I am, what I stand for, what I actually believe, how I actually feel, is not out there. There is a cartoon character. But to be honest with you, 30 years of this, my ass is so numb, I hardly feel the cock when it goes in. <laughs> the power that motivates me to become the person that I am and carrying on being the power that I am also comes from people's disdain, hate, and uh, lacerations, and you know, hate, just hate. Mm -hmm. You know, that's been a potent force in the making of me, both ways. Mm -hmm. A, for my psychology and how I feel about myself, but B, for what I've achieved. Yeah. But I find it very difficult, I find it very difficult to forgive. I think if the other person or people come to the table at the same place as I am, I find it incredibly easy to forgive. Mm. It's so easy, you know, but 
if they don't, I carry on in this drinking the poison, expecting somebody else to die sort of thing. Yeah, well, that's massively how it is. Um, yeah, see, for me, it's, it's probably quite a, a, it's not a selfish thing per se, but if you want to achieve enlightenment, which I, I would suggest everybody gives that a go, it's like if you're in the, the marble championship of the universe and you've got your pot of marbles, all the time you've got an axe to grind with someone or you haven't forgiven them or, or, or you know, they're, they're arousing these emotions in you. It's like you've taken some of your marbles out and you're putting them in their pot and then you're wondering why you're, why you're not winning the, you know, the marble championship okay. of the universe, right? Yeah, so I get it. It's, it's like, forgive them, forget it. You know, if it's the bullies at school is an example a lot of people come, or, you know, something a lot of people suffer from. Forgive them. They was probably victimized, bullied, come from broken homes themselves. They, if you met them today on the street, would probably be the first to apologize. For, forget it. And th this is kind of what I say. Um, and yeah, but it's only because that it's... It goes back to what you were saying before. It comes back to empathy again. To, to understand everybody is to forgive everybody, is a saying that I saw and was like, yeah. fucking out. You know, it's like, yeah, if you understood everybody, you'd forgive them. Mm. It's not, it's, I, I think a lot of people listening, I, or I know because I've said this before on podcasts, I think I said it on Sean's podcast, it's not a weak. It's not a weakness. It's not about, you know. No, it's uh, that was one of the lyric. One of the lyrics was, uh, "I'm not giving up. I'm letting go." Yeah, it's a strength. It's a strength of character to understand, to empathise with other people's situation, to see why they behaved in the way they did, and just to let it go. Um, so. Yeah, <laughs> hope that helps somebody listening. But going back to the media, I no, no, it helped me. It helped me. You know, it's like I'm like a fucking Rottweiler with that stuff. I just won't let it go. It's um, another lovely quote I heard this the other day. It's like lift the weights in your own gym. <laughs> you know? Yes. Don't don't be at the window of your gym looking at the gym across the road going, oh, they got nice dumbbells. It's Fuck yeah. that shit. You lift the weights in your own gym. You do the workout here. You know, it's, it's stop, you know, stop. Hey mate, listen, I need to go for a pee and I also need to get some food. Hmm. <laughs> well, it's been amazing talking to you. Hasn't it been great? Yeah. I've loved it. I, I knew that we would instantly have, um, a, an understanding also, you know, it's like I've, I'm kind of sitting on the sidelines watching things occur and seeing the same YouTube clips, knowing things, knowing certain things are just like batshit crazy, but also knowing that there's a lot of truth in there. You know, it's, it's been nice to get this off my chest mm -hmm. to go just fucking pause for poise man don't die on that hill because we haven't got the facts we haven't got the facts the, the amount of bullshit that has been created in the places that we go to over the last last seven weeks because of what's happened in the last seven weeks that remain unfulfilled that remain not happening that remain no proof of but people are fucking sure that it's truth. Guys, just it's a back, lot it, back down a little bit. It makes sense that a lot of it's smoke and mirrors, though, isn't it? A lot of it's fabricated to, to purposely take people off the, the, re, the real suppose, agenda on the planet. Yeah, I suppose that could be true, too, because, yeah, how do you... Controlling the enemy would be the first task, I would have thought. The people and listen, if they exist and they're as, as smart as we believe them to be, why wouldn't they be in control of this narrative too? That's what we... <laughs> they're not, you know, if they exist, they're not just going to sit there going, 
oh shit <laughs> they're going to get smart yeah well they are smart they've been doing this for thousands of you know since the days of the pyramids and uh and uh they it they... may chris if they have oh they have you know we, yeah I, look <laughs> i'm as i think that that is true i have a belief that that is true would i die on that hill and worship of the church of that i don't know if i would i'm not as sure as you well it's at the end of the day um, i say to everybody you get one life if you live it right one is enough and i i don't let this get to me i'm not afraid of anything rob you know i I'm just, I'm not afraid. I'm like I said, I'm carbon molecules. What, what can happen to me? Well, I go back to this beautiful universe that I love anyway. So I know that's, that's a good deal for me. Um, but while I'm in this form, while I've got this kind of, uh, this, this, uh, vehicle to experience which is life experiencing itself, right? I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have the best time possible. I'm going to smile. I smile at the sun every morning and I thank I, uh, this, this form of me. Thanks, Mother Nature, for, for giving me another day on this beautiful planet. I've had three of, my, three of my best friends now die from two drank themselves to death and one uh, drowned on when we took LSD. And so it's, you know, it's all very, very real for me, you know, and that devil that you talked about is, we, we, even if we're talking in metaphorical terms or literary I'm terms. Not. No, I know. I know, I, I know that. Yeah, I know that. I know that feeling, Rob. I know it. When you wake up in the night, think he's got me again, isn't he? He's got me again. And this is why we fight the good fight, you know. This is why we believe in ourselves. This is why we have to have ultimate self-love. This is why we love every, everybody, every other being on this planet. Oh, mate, listen, I love people. Love people. Mm -hmm. I That's love connections. You know, I love connections. Uh, I love empathy. I love compassion. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in love with the planet. I'm in love with its people. Um, which is weird cause I'm an agrophobe <laughs> <laughs> being a lad from Stoke and, um, coming from centuries of navvies, you, you, you haven't got a clue what and how to do stuff with your finances. And then you realize this is the, then this is the, the loophole that you get in. You're constantly chasing your tail. It's like now that you've got that, you have to pay for that every year and the upkeep of that. It's not a complaint. It's just an observation. You know, it's, a, it's, an, it's, an, it's, an, it's an observation. So, yeah, I have this ruddy great big house. And then I worry about my finances and having to pay for it every year. So I think that um, what people do in my situation, I've noticed they sort of have that big splurge of fame where um, the financial tap gets turned on and then the, the flow of that sort of decreases. And um, I think people go on to simplify their lives and get rid of things. And that's what I'm in the process of doing right now is going, okay, well, I've experienced this. This has been a lot of fun, but, um, for my age, where I am, what I've been through, what's happened to me, you know, having financial insecurity perhaps shouldn't exist. Mm. Can we just, let's just jump in there, Rob, and say, it seems to be this period where someone's, they've had the massive fame, they've had the girls, the cars, the, you, 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 and, and let's remember, 
that a lot of us, myself included, when I came into writing, which was which was my art, right? I had one goal, and it was I want I wanted my five minutes of fame, <laughs> right? You know, I'd always, you know, I had a dysfunctional childhood, as as we've already discussed, and I felt I felt kind of like overlooked, you know. I thought, do you know what? I'm going to start writing this book, Eating Smoke. So I started writing that off my fucking head, right? And I thought, I'm going to write a best selling book. People are going to, you know, enjoy it. That will be my thing, right? But he, he, here's the thing overwhelmingly, it seems that celebrities have this desperate yearning, uh, maybe desperate's the wrong word, but a yearning to, to be acknowledged and recognized. And when they have this initial success, and it's, everything's gravy, and then it goes away, then it seems that, that these Satanists, if we want to call them, that and, and and my jury's out, Rob. Always, right? I, I I can't I can't go on hearsay. I can only go on what what I see. But it seems that they come in there, they get the they offer the celebrity the deal. You know, you're going to be rich again. You're going to be famous again. Here's the million dollar contract, but it it comes with clauses. They call it a Faustian packed and i won't even pretend i know who faust was i don't know if he was the writer or the character i think it was the character in a play i like knowing that it's called a faustian pact because as somebody pointed out it adds to the pseudo intellectualism that we have but it's i think that's where the intellectualism stops is like we know it's called something we just don't know why it's called that <laughs> i think that if i am being used then I don't know about it. You know, it's like I can, you know, let's, let's talk about the comments about which, which sort of make me laugh and at the same time scare me and at the same time uh, find them infuriating. All of those different things, infuriating, scary, and make me laugh. You know, that sort of, Let's say that these very powerful, clever forces have run this world for centuries, which is kind of what we believe, right? We don't know, but it's kind of what we believe. So three weeks ago, those forces had a meeting and decided to send Robbie Williams. <laughs> you know, how did that meeting go? So in that meeting, when they're all chatting, decided to send Robbie Williams to talk to Chris Thrall. So I did that meeting go, should we send Beyonce? Well, she's not answering. Should we send uh, Rihanna? Uh, too unpredictable. What about Gaga? Well, no one's going to believe her at the minute. You know, Williams? Well, Robin Williams is dead. No, no, Robbie Williams. Robbie Williams? <laughs> is that... Is that, is that genuinely the level that people actually think things happen? Because this is the scary thing about all of this. It's becoming a religion, a religion where, where people would rather believe than know. Mate, uh, why didn't they send me Kim Wilde? Come on. Listen, she, she's not going to make it into the Illuminati, is she, Kim? I love her I know, a bit. but I might get a snog out of it, you know? Who do you want us to send over next? So, yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing, you know, is... Um, and like what I was saying before, that sort of negates everything that I've done and achieved off my own back and with my own hands. Me, personally, mm. it went like this. I auditioned to be and take that. We worked our bollocks off. Like, you would not believe it. Like, you would not believe what we... And we had the energy and the ability to do it because we were really young. We started with a school in the morning, 
school in the afternoon, uh, performing, um, youth club, under 18s club, over 18s club, two gay clubs and a straight club. Day after day after day after day after day, building up this reputation. We had these cards that we used to throw into the audience with a P.O. box on the back where they could get information about us. But basically what those cards were, were uh, information data. Because once we had your information, this was then worth something. And this is basically what happened. No record company wanted to sign us at all. Boy bands were dead. But we amassed 70,000 of these cards with people's information on it. The record company that signed us, BMG, bought the cards, bought the information, bought the data that we came with. That was what was worth money to them, not us, our image, or our songs. And then we and them exploited that, and we got lucky, had a hit with... Uh, only takes a minute girl and the phenomena grew, you know, um, I left, I wrote and recorded a bunch of songs. I released four of them and, uh, with lesser degrees of success and a note went around the record company. We're about to drop Robbie Williams that week. Angels came out and angels changed absolutely everything for me now when i went on stage and performed these songs people like what i did not everybody lots of people fucking hate what i do i totally get it i'm just saying the people that came to those shows liked what they experienced told people about it bought somebody with them and that audience grew and grew and grew off my sweat off my back with this throat with this mind with these jazz hands. I fucking did that. You know, now, if you think in 96 that I went and had a clandestine meeting with somebody and, um, and they, they made it possible for me to become an international pop star, your intuition and the way, the prism that you view the world is off. Now, I can only give you that information. You can lead a horse to, you can lead a horse to culture, but you can't make them think, you know, you can lead a horse to water, etc. Now, also, if you can't ascertain real soul and real authenticity and real truth when you're being presented with it, then you're fucked. Also, you can't see these people. You can't see their lives. You can't see who they are. So the flatness of text, you can't get much of a read on these people might be dreadfully unhappy. These people might be suffering with some sort of mental illness. These people might be all of those things combined. Mm -hmm. But when it goes into my computer as a human, um, it has very detrimental effects very detrimental effects. And I, I need, this is something that I've come up with myself. I need to sort this out because there's um, undue pain happening caused by the words of strangers. It has a very powerful effect and hold on my life. And I don't know why, but I know that I need to release that to live a happier life. I seem to be addicted to finding people that will tell me what I can't am. I think if you see like-minded people and you see the aspects about them that you respond to, that you think are beautiful, you fucking tell those people you've seen it. You know, it's deadly important to tell people, hey, that thing you did, I really like it. I really admire it. Uh, you know, I admire your courage and I admire your strength. There you go, brother. You know, I, I think, especially if these things, only if these things come from the heart. But um, it's important to reach out to people and say, I've noticed you being amazing. <laughs> Who doesn't want to hear that? Who doesn't want to hear somebody say a nice thing to them meant from the heart?
you know? Uh, anyway, I've got to go play golf online. <laughs> it's a fucking hard <laughs> life, mate. It's uh, a hard life. From the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> um, I just want to clarify something I said on the, um, the last thing. I was actually clarifying my, my opinion from where I come from. And I said at one point I was the biggest pop star on the planet. And um, arguably, let's just say arguably. And there has been right. comments, you know, there's been comments going, you know, well, you weren't. We, here's where I come from. I said that to clarify the next thing that I, I meant. To, to be honest with you, when I say that, it doesn't come from an egoic place because I actually am more bewildered than any of you fuckers out there with the prospect that that actually happened to me. <laughs> it bewilders me. The reason I said that was because, you know, they just paid me the biggest contract in the history of music. I just, I own a Guinness Book of Records for selling the most tickets, you know. And people pointing out about America and me not being famous there. Granted, guys, I bet you the biggest pop star on this planet is in China and we don't know who the fuck he is. <laughs> Over there, they have TV shows that have ratings of two billion. Two fucking billion. And we've never heard of them. The reason I did say that was that I went on to qualify. If that was the case, where was my meeting? Where was the shadowy figures coming up to me and going, oi, we want you in the club? It didn't happen. I said to myself when I lived in a vision of brown in the hills of Beverly Shire, fuck me, this needs an upgrade. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to wait till I find a wife, then she can do it. So she did it. You know, she got a, she got a budget and off she went. And she did this house in London and she did it impeccably. Her style and her taste is just, I bow down to her. She's a, she's a maven when it comes to that stuff. Does my wife know that I'm talking to you about this tonight? Does my wife know anything about this subject? No, not really. You know, every now and again, when there's a nugget, a gold nugget, I'll just go, here, look at this. So she has the information, you know, and she'll go mm, like that. The rest of the time, she goes off and buys some furniture. She likes fucking butterflies. <laughs> I don't arrive into my living room in that London house and look at the, um, the, the, the table and think monarch mind control. I just think there's a nice table that my wife bought. You know, that's, yeah. that's the, um, Mate, the I don't think you could be monarch mind control to have the conversation we, we just had. But that's when you get into the layers and layers and layers of conspiracy, you know, which will un undoubtedly happen. Um, yeah, and butterflies are beautiful things too. You know, I, I like a butterfly. Mm. Um, but that's about the size of it. You know, when I, I read, I was walking around the Bodhi Tree, which is a, a, a very, very powerful bookshop here in Los Angeles. Incredible. It sort of had what we consider to be the truth of everything. It was a mind-blowing bookshop about the esoteric. And I bent down, and there was David Icke's book, and I picked it up, and I opened it, and read a bit, and went, "Fuck me!" It spoke to me, you know. It spoke to me, and I, um, yeah, it spoke to me and led me to many different places. Uh, and if you look at me in my radio, there's a song called Radio, and in that I grow a tail out of my ass, and that is me going. Anybody else checking this? Anybody else seeing this? Uh, anybody else get what this reference is? You know, which is, which is why there has to be care and attention drawn to throwing dispersions at people on the internet, jumping into their comment rooms and claiming them to have affiliations with the darkest forces that have ever ruled this planet. How can you just do, how can you cast that dispersion upon somebody without having firm evidence. Yeah. I'd you know. say it's, it, to anybody listening, you know, don't 
say something in a comment section you wouldn't say to our faces people you, don't you, you just look like a twat you just you know it, it it's not a free referendum to just or people forum not, rather to that's it chris people never ever say to my face what people write in comment sections mm. In my day-to-day -day life, at least for the last 15 years, I mean, when I lived in Stoke, they did. They said it to my face. <laughs> uh, and they also gave me a lot of love too. But um, these days, you think anybody comes up to me and says what well, anybody said, leaves anonymously in a comment room? Well, here's, here's the thing too, just to delve back into the love aspect of it because I can get carried away with, how excellent and inflaming it feels to be angry and vitriolic towards people. There is a real energy in that, and I felt it. You know, it's visceral. To dip back into the love energy for a second, you know, we all have our blind spots. Chris has his blind spots. Me, Rob, I have my blind spots. And they are blind spots because we can't fucking see them. Those people that are leaving comments too, you have your blind spots too. Be kind. If you spot something about us that we can't see about ourselves, you don't have to shout at us. We just don't know. Let us not know. Just let us not know. It takes nothing out of your day. If you see it and it annoys you, go about your day. Go about your day. You're not going to change us. <laughs> so for everybody at home, massive, uh, massive love to you all. Thanks for watching another um edition of the Bought the Seashirt podcast. Massive thank you to Robbie for just coming on and speaking his truth and that's all we can do in life. So Rob, thank you, mate. Bless you, Chris, and bless everybody out there in listening land. Keep fighting the good fights. Have discernment and try and stay in the love. I'm gonna try my best. I do enjoy hating a lot. It's, um, it's powerful, but uh, it's progress and not perfection that I'm seeking. I'm off to seek some more love. Why don't you all join me? <laughs> <laughs>